Welcome back to our study of 1 Samuel. This is session two, but the first session was simply designed to prepare us to read 1 Samuel properly, and so now we get to do just that. I want to begin without delay by reading the portion of text we're going to cover today, chapter one. Uh, we won't always, of course, have the time to read the entirety of it, but this time, thankfully, we do. 1 Samuel begins like this. There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zufite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives, and one was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. And this went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who's deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. And then she went away and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. And when her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, After the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah told her. Stay here until you have weaned him, only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed at home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an eva of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli, and she said to him, Pardon me, my lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside, beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child. And the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Now, at one level, this is unquestionably a story about a person in pain who cries out to God and finds help. We will say more, but we must not say less. We will become aware of the deeper dimensions of what Hannah may symbolize, but before she symbolizes anything, she is a person, she is a woman, and she is in pain. Though favored by her husband, she is barren. And if any of you or anyone you know has experienced infertility, you know how painful a process this can be. You come to a point in your life when you are ready and excited to welcome new life into the world so that you might raise up more humans and send them out to do the same, but you find that you can't. This is, of course, a painful experience for husbands and wives, but the wives experience it internally because it's their own body that, for whatever reason, won't do what it certainly seems designed to do. It is painful in any day and age. And you may be aware that in ancient times, a woman's role was a bit more specified than it is in our culture. Women, of course, are still the only ones that can bear children and bring them into the world in these precise ways, but there are many more opportunities that are available to women in terms of contributing to society and whatnot. But in this world, it really was by far and away the primary way that you contributed to the world. A woman's job was to produce children, and she can't. It is painful. It is embarrassing. It is dishonorable. 
and it hurts. And to make matters worse, literally in this, literally in this case, to add insult to injury, she's not the only wife. You got Panina over here, Elkanah's other wife, and though Elkanah himself loves Hannah more, it kind of seems to everybody around like God prefers Panina because she's the one with all these kids and she just keeps digging. Man, you wonder the things she said. You wonder if some of these other kids are old enough to ask aloud, why doesn't Hannah have any children? And Panina might say, I don't know. Why don't you ask her? Better yet, why don't you ask the Lord? I don't know what kinds of things she said, but they hurt and they seem to get worse when they went to church. Isn't that sometimes how it goes? You come to this place where you want to worship God, and if you're in a painful situation, people look at you like you're the problem. Maybe there's a certain well-wisher that attempts to make things better by saying some kind words that don't feel that kind at all. I mean, this is the role that Elkanah plays in the story. Poor guy. Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? No, buddy, you don't. But thanks for trying. She just wants a child, and so she acts. She goes to the Lord and she makes a request. She finally says, I've had enough. And year after year of worshiping at the annual festival, she's like, I'm just going to go and I'm going to tell the Lord what's up. And she says in no uncertain terms, this is what I want. And I am promising you, I make a vow to you that if you give me the child I ask, this child will be devoted to you his entire life. The result of this initially is that Eli misinterprets her, thinks she's actually drunk because he can't hear the sounds coming out of her mouth. But she corrects him and he accepts the correction and He offers her a blessing and says that the Lord will give what she has asked. She goes home and she lies with her husband and she conceives and she gives birth to a son. And then for the next three years, it probably would have been about three years until she had the child fully weaned, she raises this baby and, and we're left to wonder and we're left to fill in the blanks with our imagination. You picture the adoration as she pulls this baby close. You imagine the amount of prayers that she prays over this child knowing knowing that he's a great gift, but knowing that she's got to give him back, knowing that she won't be there for all of the years of his life, those day-in, day-out moments that a mother craves so much, she prays over him with joy and probably with some anxiety. I would imagine that she began to tell him the story, probably before he could even understand it. And certainly as he came to a point where he started to understand the words, you are here for a reason, you are here on purpose, you are not an accident, you are a gift from the Lord. I am so grateful for you. I love you, Samuel. In more than a few ways, Hannah presents here to us a model because after these three years, she doesn't hold on to this child, but she demonstrates her understanding of God's gift by joyfully giving back what is given. And the boy worshiped the Lord there at Shiloh. Yes, she is indeed a heroine of the faith. She is indeed a model of the type of approach to God that God looks on with kindness. And speaking of which, there really is another layer here to the story. There's a second level at which we realize that there's something more going on. No question this is a story about Hannah and her pain, but there's these, there's this like trail of crumbs. There's these hints and clues that indicate to us that maybe there's something else happening. I mentioned previously that the book of 1 Samuel follows the book of Judges, this time period in Israel's life when she had no centralized monarchy, she had no king, but when she found herself in trouble, typically because she rebelled against God, and she cried out to God against her oppressors, God would send judges to come and deliver the people, and they would live in peace for a time until they forgot and disobeyed again. It's this ugly cycle over and over and over. Well, one of the most well-known judges then and now is a man named Samson, who you might remember never cut off his hair. Well, then it did, and you know the story. But the point is, Hannah knows the story, and she prays, I will devote this child to you to be another Samson. This tells us that there's maybe a little bit more going on here than simply Hannah being a human who wants God to give what she asks. And as you continue to read, the connections multiply, and you realize that in important ways, Hannah really does symbolize Israel in this story. Her situation really is a window into Israel's situation. Though the favored bride loved by her husband, she is bested and provoked by her rival Panina, a thorn in her side. Though the favored bride loved by her God, Israel is bested and provoked time and again by the Philistines, this thorn in their side. The oppressor is fruitful where the faithful is barren. The world is not as it should be. Yes, Hannah's story parallels Israel's, but there's maybe more, we hope, because Hannah's barrenness is not the first time we've seen something like this. Her situation echoes others, situations that speak of not only pain but promise. You're probably thinking of Sarah, who was barren before she had Isaac, and Rebecca, who was barren before she gave birth to Jacob, and Rachel, the favored wife, who was barren before she bore Jacob's sons and moved the story of God's promise forward. These births spoke of a new day, and maybe Hannah's will do the same. 
These connections that we begin to see as we unpack the story reinforce this idea that Hannah is a symbol for Israel, that she's a model for us. She really does mirror the people of God in the past and the situation of Israel in her present. And the question that this provides for us is, will the people of God look like Hannah as Israel's future unfolds? Yes, Hannah symbolizes Israel in this book. Yet ultimately, ultimately at the deepest level, while this is a story about Hannah, And while this is a story about Israel, this is, of course, most of all, a story about God. A God who sees our pain, who hears our cries, and who has the resources to bring good out of our darkest valleys. It's about a God who is sovereign over history, but whose sovereign power takes shape in some very strange ways. First Samuel is a story about powerful men occupying important positions and fighting epic battles that turn the wheels of history. It's big, but it begins with the tears of a barren woman from the hills and a God who listens to the prayer his own priest literally cannot hear. Hannah is not how you start a story about kings, but this isn't a story about kings, is it? 1 Samuel is a strange story because Yahweh is an odd God, or at least he seems odd, depending on the state of your eyes and ears. And there is our prayer as we set out to study 1 Samuel, to see this God about whom these stories testify, and to hear his wisdom for our way forward even again today. So may we be given ears to hear and eyes to see the God of Hannah, the God of Israel, the God of Jesus.